Portuguese colony. It was a Portuguese colony till the 60s. So it has a lot of Portuguese architecture. It's a lot like Buenos Aires from the videos I have seen. And uh, I thought when I went to Goa, I might just buy a Brazil jersey because the, the nature there, the trees, the water, the rivers, all of that is a bit like coastal Brazil. So I just brought this jersey to signify that. And yeah, uh, yeah so I fell in love with football because of Messi and Brazil, Argentina. Let's start with those countries. Those are the first countries yeah. which come to mind when you think of South America. So, what does your book exactly talk about these countries? Well, I am, I am uh, initially, thanks so much for inviting me yeah, for, for your pod podcast. I think it's a great initiative. Yeah, so, my book, yeah, it's called Tales of South American Football, Passion, Revolution and Glory. It was published by Fair Play Publishing. Yeah, well, my book, it's it's exactly uh, about the passion, the, the, the home of football, which is South America. I am originally from Brazil. I am from the southernmost part of Brazil. So I usually, I used to travel a lot to Argentina and, and Uruguay when I was, I was a child with my, with my parents. And what I think, yeah, my, my book, this book, yeah, Tales of South American Football has 13 chapters. And in all the chapters, uh, I discuss how football is intertwined with the social life, the cultural life, and the political life of these countries. For example, there is, there is a specific chapter about Afonso. Afonso was a player in the 70s during Brazil dictatorship. And he was an amazing player, but the, there was a rule back in Brazil where it, it was similar in, in Europe, yeah, where uh, players were attached to clubs even if they didn't have a contract, yeah? So they couldn't move on unless the, the club released them. Of course, yeah, you had to pay. And Afonso was a rebel just because he had different ideas. He was against the dictatorship and he had uh, long hair. So I discuss cases such as Afonso or the case of Socrates, who was also uh, uh, one of the, the top 100 footballers. He still is yeah, one of yeah, the top 100 footballers in history, and he was also a leader of a democratic uh, movement during the dictatorship to regain the right uh, mm -hmm. for Brazilians to, to vote for the president. It was called Free Elections Now, and with his team, he was always going to, to the fields uh, with banners, yeah, Free Elections Now, and, and things like that. Yeah, same with Maradona, same with Messi. They were always involved in a way or, or another way in, in, the, in the social life and the political life of, of their country. So I think this interconnection yeah, between football, players, supporters that are called hinchadas in, in, in South Inchad, America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Chadas in, in Spanish, Torcidas in Portuguese. Yeah, it's what my, my book is about. That's why I talk about the passion that South Americans have for for their football. Men, women, everyone love their football, but also hate uh, how many things are have been doing in football, the repression, the politics, but also how they have used football to start small or big revolutions to ask for for social change mm -hmm. and glory because football there is glorious yeah the, the final chapter is about Messi and Pelé I mean there are not yeah, bigger and better figures yeah, yeah. in terms of playing than Messi and Pelé that bring glory to our subcontinent. Okay, so that's a really great introduction to the book by you, sir. Yeah, I mean, football, I think, maybe not in India, but 
football has a lot more to do with the culture and also the social uh, battles which the people fight for themselves because football is one place where the fans can come together and send a message which they want to am i right so yes sure uh, so has this been the case always in south america well i think so for them i am wearing uh, boca juniors jersey yeah uh, signed by by Uh, Diego Maradona. Wow, really? You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know that uh, Maradona. Yeah, he, of course, he was, he was a rebel. Yeah, you couldn't control him. Yeah, one of the best players that we had. But he also had a very strong. Uh, social justice mindset. He was always yes. allied with uh, left-wing uh, leaders in South America, uh, in Bolivia, in Cuba, uh, uh, Morais, Castro, uh, and, and others allied with... with yeah, he, he was a rebel. Uh, that's one, one of the motives that he was so... Uh, prosecuted and all, all, all the things that have been done against him with the drugs and things that wouldn't be done to a, a, a regular player. Yeah. And Maradona, Maradona is considered there is a, a Maradona church. Yeah, in, I know. I know. I know. In, in Buenos Aires, in Argentina. Yeah. And I wear, I wear this, this the Boca Junior the Boca Junior jersey because I think it translates everything that is that is about the passion and the revolution in, in South American football. I explain it. I explain to you. You know uh, why why Boca Junior has these colors, uh, this blue and gold. You can no, see no, the no. gold here. So it was chosen uh, the Boca Juniors it's a football club that comes from La Boca. La Boca is a very poor, poor neighborhood. Yeah. Neighborhood, neighborhood in, in, in it's a slum in, in Buenos Aires, what we call a, a favela. Yeah. So the fans, there were uh, heaps of migrants from Europe, from, it, from Italy, Italy mm -hmm. and Spain, and other places in La Boca. The beginning of last century, at the beginning of the 20th century. So they were putting together the club. They decided the name. They decided everything. But they were undecided about the colors mm -hmm. of the club. So this Italian migrant, who he was responsible to open uh, the the wharf, the harbor, for for the the ships that were arriving from overseas. So he said, "Well, the next ship." That arrives, yeah, with their flag, will be our our team colors. Everybody uh, agreed, and it was a Swedish uh, ship. That's why it's it's it, it has these these colors. And you know that Boca Junior in the nineties has changed a lot. It became there was it was kind of broken the club with no money so the, uh, the some young people yeah some young entrepreneurs neoliberal entrepreneurs took over the club including a man called Mauricio Macri who later on became the the country's president so for you to see how important it is to be the president of a club of a football club mm -hmm. then you become Uh, your the 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 campus uh, president, but on that time, you know uh, Nike, the the sponsor of the of the club, the sponsor of the jersey, they put together a new jersey with a new technology, okay, that you could wear without sweating. Mm -hmm. So they said it was good. Not only for the players because the, the jersey would not be heavy, but also for supporters. I mean, Argentinians they dance 
and yeah, they, they jump for the no Avante, for the whole 90 minutes. Yeah, they yeah, support yeah. their team even when the team is losing. After the match, they can they will criticize a lot, but during the match, they support from mm -hmm. uh, middle zero to to the end. And so Daiko was saying, ah, you can go and support and jump and dance yeah, with this new jersey, with this new technology. And afterwards, you can just go to a party, go to a restaurant because it won't be sweating, no smelling. And then the fans protested. They didn't wear a, a, a jersey that, that didn't have the signs of your efforts, they Ooh, were saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. players they have to to show the their yeah. garra, garra, garra in Spanish means that you have fought, you have the claw, you garra means your, the claw, right? your yeah. blood. So they wanted to see in the jersey that the players were giving everything they had. Mm -hmm. So this is just to show you. The clashes that are between neoliberal ideologies within what we call modern modern football and the traditional more community, uh, the traditional and more community doctrines that have created football in South America. That's a really beautiful story, sir. Actually, these are the kinds of stories why I make podcasts because. I really like, I have seen a documentary of Copa 90 between Boca and River and the distinction, the differences between them and also the similarities. It's really, really beautiful to see how a club can evolve from a, such a humble roots to go on to winning so many things and then establishing themselves as a really great identity. Like you said, the sweating thing. It's such a huge part of their identity, the garra, the fighting for the 90 minutes. Boca is always about that. Am I right? Even your, I think your book, uh, the cover page of your book behind you, the uh, wallpaper of your background. I think even that is inspired from Boca. Am I right? Yes, yes, you're right. Yeah. I'll leave it here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People can see. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I think it's inspired uh, on the one side by Boca and also I think by, by the vibrant colors of South America. I think yeah, for many people, uh, South America as a continent is a mystery. Mm. Yeah, and what I can see and what I I like about this book Ed, is that by reading each chapter, you can come closer to the mystery and of South America and South America football because it's really interconnected to the daily lives of, of people. You know, the, the women who, who fought her way uh, to, to be now, there is, it was just announced one or two days ago that there is the first women's uh, World Cup, FIFA World Cup in, in South America will be played 27 in, in Brazil. Brazil, but yeah. women, women in South America fought a lot just for the right to play football. It's still, they still fight. For example, in Brazil, there was there were laws in the the last what the last thirty years or more, thirty years yeah. plus, that, that these laws they forbade women to play football. Yes, yeah, so it was. Uh, uh, a big battle for them to just to wear yeah, boots and to to just to kick a ball. Yeah, it was and it is it still is part of their human life. I cannot hear you, sir. When I was talking about uh, women's football and yeah, 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 and, I heard the uh, fact that right. you said there was a lot of struggle for the women to play football and that. They, the, the families didn't support them, the governments didn't support them, but hopefully that is now changing because I think uh, Brazil has produced really great players. I think I know Marta and Marta is probably one of my favorite female footballers which I know. 
because of her skills like like she dribbles a lot like the brazilian players you know the brazilian flair like she has i think i really like that about marta but i think the other south american countries are pretty far behind I mean, argentina with the kind of talent pool they have they've had maradona and messi we don't see that translating into women's football do we no i think so i think there are people i think for example there is marta yeah, yeah, in brazil she got what six uh, Ballon d'Or as as the, the the best player, yeah, more than many 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 players. I think there is new ger- generations of of players. Yeah, the women. I talk in the book. It's specifically about the the Bolivian ones. And I think what what we we need to to have in mind. And there are chapters in my book talking about this. It's not only about about being being a woman, yeah, and that's what what I think. Yeah, the the Bolivians represent this because it's it's very different being a woman, yeah, in the global north and having all all the the benefits and training and etc. Then being uh, being a woman in the global south, like the the mining women who were poor, who were not white, yeah, who had who had still have uh, different body shapes, different traditions, different hairs, uh, different liberties, different sexual life. Yeah, so lots lots of prejudices. I mean, they they have it's not because they are they are women that they are the same yeah because there are different uh, uh, intersectional realities that may oppress them them or not I talk about this in the book I talk about a, a Bolivian woman called Domitilia Barros she wasn't a, a football player but Domitilia uh, in, in the 70s she was a she was uh, the spouse of a, a minor, a Bolivian minor, mm-hmm. who wore the strike, but she was also uh, a minor herself. Oh. And she was, she went in 1974, 1975, if not wrong, uh, to Mexico City, where the United Nations organized the first meeting about the women's women's conditions, women's lives. Yeah, you know, that was when the UN started to discuss specifically issues, specific issues about women, and there were plenty, plenty of of feminist leadership, including Betty Friedman and others, uh, but they were all doctors, teachers, lawyers, etc. And when was the time of Domitilia to talk? Said, "Look, I have nothing to do with you. It's not because we are." women that we are the same my social condition is different and i think this social condition is what yeah the the south american women the brazilian the argentinian the bolivian the paraguayan uh, they manifest when they go they go to the field for them i think it's really uh, let's say it's much more than a game this really applies to them yeah, because their their struggle is enormous. Yeah, you see, we talk a lot, but even in the last World Cup, which was in Australia, where where I am, I am located. There were teams from Jamaica, from from other other countries that the the players didn't didn't receive their Easter pens, their minimum Easter pens to to yeah. leave. So it's still it's still. It's a big fight. It's not because uh, women's football is doing well in Europe that is doing well in, in South America. So the hopes are that with with this World Cup, uh, things will will become better for them. I believe. Yeah, I mean, with the kind of audience that South America can garner with the kind of support, I think if they modernize a bit further, then they have a lot of scope in women's football as well. I mean. The, the way you've said, they've come a long way from 70s till 2020 now. And I think, obviously, since they've come such a long way, the end is the end will be much easier. So, hopefully, 
they grow a lot but uh, now that you've talking you've spoken about the world cup i also wanted to talk to you about a personal you know a really important personal question for me leo messi's world cup what influence did it have on argentina and south america did it change people's minds that maradona from maradona is the goat to messi is the goat or do some people still favor maradona <laughs> well i think this will be always always uh, a big question for Argentinians. I think it's also a question of of generations. Yeah, because Maradona became, it's, it's what Maradona represents what the, the old Argentinian generation admired. Yeah, there is a tango that exactly describes uh, Maradona's uh, story. Uh, the boy that came from a very poor neighborhood and and climbed his way to the gold through, through football. And I mean, Maradona has scored, has played, and has won the most, what we call the most geopolitical football match in football's history, which was in mm. 1986 in the Mexican in the Mexico World Cup, yeah, uh, Argentina and, and England, when yeah. he scored twice. First, with La Mano de Dios, yeah, the uh, God's hand, yeah, mm -hmm. that goal, yeah, with today wouldn't be allowed because of VAR. And <laughs> second, one of the most, if not the most, the fabulous beautiful. goal yeah, yeah. In, in World Cup history, yeah, dribbling, uh, dribbling everyone. But that first goal, that's of course after that, that Maradona became a, a dios, yeah, a god. Because when asked, uh, you score your goal with a hand, he said, no, it wasn't by hand, it was God's hand. <laughs> so he became, he became a god, yeah, right. dios. Yeah. And, and Messi, well, Messi, of course, yeah, he's the goal. Yeah, in, in the twentieth, the twenty-first century, yeah, lots of uh, golden boots and ballon doors and, and and everything, and also he won this, yeah, the the last World Cup in Qatar. I think it, it's it's divided. Yeah, it's a it's a. But I I can't see. I don't see. Yeah, this this huge argument between between Argentinians. I think there is a space for them to love both. Both in their hearts. And, and yeah. mostly because also uh, there is there is a, a, a thing that uh, they didn't I mean like Maradona. Maradona was had this kind of big temper, yeah. He had Issues with everyone. He had, and my book describes this. For example, his big issue, big controversies with Kikelmi, yeah, who mm. now is is Boca Junior president. And, yeah. But he he never had these issues with Messi, mostly because Messi never played in Argentina. So there is this advantage to Messi. Yeah, he didn't like ah okay. Yeah. If Messi was playing for a club, the other other support, other interest. Yeah, let's say Messi was playing for River Plate. Yeah, Boca Juniors uh, interest would not like him, but that wasn't the case for him. He never played yeah. there. Yeah, he started very young as a teenager in Barcelona. Now he's playing. He has played most of his life in Barcelona, then in in Paris, and now in the US, in Miami, I think. So I, I think, think that there is there is there is a space for, for both. I think both of them are committed with social justice causes. Yeah. For example, Messi I described this in the last last chapter of, of my book of Tales of South America, how Messi has been involved with the the mothers and grandmothers of the, the Plus of Mayo that that are women, who are women, mm -hmm. who still fight to find their 
their sons, their daughters, their grandsons, their grandchildren who have been kidnapped by the militaries, by the military dictatorship during the 70s and 80s. They're still there, and Messi has always shown, shown his, his support to them. Yeah, has oh. recorded, has been part of the, their campaign. So they are, I think they are both very uh, connected to the political life, and the social justice causes in, in Argentina. But yeah, I think Maradona comes from a, a different moment. <laughs> yeah, in that, that win in, in the 1986 World Cup, yeah, when he scored twice, yeah, the I think God's Maradona hand. Win was a bigger statement. Do you think so? Yeah, because, because the the, the issues more. with with the the Falklands slash Malvinas war mm -hmm. were not healed on that moment. Were not healed. Yeah, the the war was very recent. People had friends, had cousins, had relatives who passed away in, in that war. So it was there was still so much tension between both countries. That's what that's why I said at the beginning of this, yeah, a few minutes ago, that this was the most geopolitical yeah, uh, football match in World Cup history, yeah, because there was lots of tensions. And yeah. to end in the way it ended, yeah, I know that if you have viewers, uh, British viewers, they will hate me. <laughs> but I just, I just love the story. I just love the Man of the Jews. I just love the uh, the God's hand go. Yeah, I think it's part of the football folklore that we don't have yeah, anymore because of VR right. and all, all the all the technology. <laughs> yeah, I know it's it brings something different to the World Cup. But uh, speaking of controversial World Cups, I think the Qatar World Cup was controversial as well. But I wanted to take a step back and go to the Copa America of 2021. If you remember it distinctly, there was COVID. Brazil was burning, Argentina was burning, Colombia and Argentina were supposed to host it, but they had too many deaths due to COVID. So they shifted the World Cup from there to Brazil. But Brazil also had many COVID deaths and people weren't allowed to watch the matches. What is your opinion on the shifting of the World Cup? What was the reason? Could you highlight it further? What was the reason? Can you repeat, please? What was the reason they shifted the Copa America from Argentina to Brazil? And uh, what was the political situation like then? Because I heard a lot of stories bashing the Brazilian president, Bolsonaro, if I'm not wrong, who was the president then. So there was a lot of fire then. So are there any stories you know regarding the Copa America 2021? Well, uh, the COVID, COVID was hitting badly everyone and Argentina decided not to host the, the, the Copa America. Yeah, there were no no many options in terms of Brazil already had the, the structure, yeah, the structure, yeah, the, the amenities, the venues, they remain. It was a good thing for Brazil the, hosting the 2014 World Cup, the stadiums, the, the new arenas are most of them, not all, but most of them are, are uh, were already well prepared to to host the the tournament. On the other hand, yeah, there was uh, Bolsonaro, yeah, this far right government who was denying the the pandemic, who did nothing in the country. Yeah, he was not wearing masks, not promoting yeah, the social distance conditions or providing funds for people or cash for people to, to stay home. I mean, he was clearly, and this is still a huge debate in Brazil, yeah, whether he he's going to, uh, yeah, to be sanctioned, to, to be punished, and at least yeah, prosecuted for what? Yeah, many people call the genocide that he promoted by denying uh, vaccination and, and support to people. So, of course, yeah, if there was a condition for him and for his government to promote football, why not? 
Yeah. Even though the stadiums were empty because people, yeah, they couldn't they couldn't open uh, stadiums for for the supporters. Uh, but I think it was on that moment, yeah, during the during the the hardship that they are going through in Argentina, that uh, the Scaloneta, yeah, the team of uh, Lionel Scaloni, yeah. uh, they, they tied up real well. I think it was in that moment that they started to, to win the Qatar World Cup yeah, because everything that was happening and the team just tied up and reunited, yeah. Uh, with with Messi, Messi yeah, rediscovered his passion to play for his nation. Yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, and... uh, uh, sorry to cut you off, but I, when I was reading the news, it was always negative about Argentina having 87% inflation and so many bad things you were hearing about Argentina. But I think this World Cup was like a really great spark of hope for the people and something to celebrate, which they didn't get for a few years. Yeah, yeah. Uh -uh. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Yeah, it was, yeah, I mean, it was kind of, I think most most of the times when you, you pick a team that is a winner in particular of in the short tournaments like a, like a World Cup, there is some, some sort of magic between them. Yeah, there is some sort of, of, of human connection, and this is what happened with with Argentina. There was a huge connection between the team, between Messi, between uh, the players and the coach, and, and the whole the whole country. You know, you know, you see how they invaded Qatar to go for the final. Yet yeah, people were selling their cars, uh, taking loans just to buy yeah. tickets and go to Qatar. It was crazy. Yeah. An Argentinian invasion, and the team to... actually delivered. You know, it's not like the fans felt that they sold their car or their house for nothing. They went there and they actually saw their team win. But yeah, uh, yeah, sir, they, I to... yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, kindly continue. No, no, I was just saying that that they they delivered. Yeah, of course, we have to praise uh, Messi. But we we also have to praise the coach, a very young coach, yes. Scaloni, who was not afraid of change, was not afraid to say no for the for old names and call the young guns, and change his tactics. I think this was this was his job. His hand was there a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a reason they call it the Scaloneta. Sir, I have two major questions left to ask you. Uh, the first one is that what do you think is the difference between South American and European culture? You highlight that. The difference? South America the... and European football cultures. <laughs> uh, South American football is poetry. European football is prose. Oh, what I mean? Yeah, South American football is dance. It's music that, as I said, it's totally connected uh, to to people's culture. Yeah, it's samba in Brazil, it's tango, it's other rhythms across across the continent. Yeah, you see how yeah, it's it's a form of dance, and uh, how European football it's more mechanic and. All the great players in terms of individual skill that we see in Europe, yeah, what they do, they do is that they they mimic what's good in, in South American football. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you say Pep Guardiola saying this. Yeah, yeah. I I look at the 1970 uh, Brazilian team with Pelé, Tostão, Jairzinho, Gerson, and well. It's there, it's there, and there is a chapter in my book oh. yeah, about this. Yeah, the the positional, the positional uh, techniques, the positional style developed by Pep Guardiola. 
comes from that 1917. Yeah, how oh. people, how the players had each one their lot, and how they moved in a organized manner to to leave that lot free. That's how uh, uh, Pep Guardiola plays. Uh, uh, the, what's the name of this flop? Uh, I think the Liverpool, Liverpool Club, manager yeah. who just left. Yeah, same thing. Yeah, they all based on on this tactic. So it's not only about about the poetry, but it's how South Americans understand the game. Of course, in Europe yeah, there yeah. is much better conditions, much more uh, money at the moment. But if you see how, uh, same with. Ancelotti, Ancelotti does what several, like Cesar Menotti or Bielsa, Ricardo, the, the, like the local, yeah. Yeah, yeah, what they do, yeah. Well, when the player has the ball, they don't say anything. You do what you want. Yeah, you are in high level. I don't have anything to teach you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you have freedom to to express your yeah. art yeah i think that's that's the uh, the main point it's not mechanic i would say yeah obviously i mean the just the number of coaches coming from argentina maybe pochettino to chola simeone to uh, bielsa to uh, well maradona was and okay going but cesar luis menotti who is sadly no more uh, we had Carlos Bilardo. I know all of these managers, and South America produces one of the best managers, one of the best managers known to all of the world. But, sir, my final question to you, the concluding question to you would be What are your thoughts on the new Copa America 2024? Whom do you think will win? Whom do you think will be the best <laughs> player? What are your thoughts? It's very rare and very, very hard to predict. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think. Well, I think Colombia can be a surprise. Oh. Yeah, I, I, I like I like the Colombian team, but we never know. Argentina is strong. Brazil is strong. Brazil has a kind of a new team. Neymar is not playing, which I think it's good for the for the national team. It's good. It's good. It's good. Yeah, because otherwise everything just just goes around around Neymar. Mm -hmm. Not only on the field but off the field as well. When Neymar and his family, they they concentrate too much attention yeah. on, on them. It's not good for the for the national team. So I think it's good that this new generation, Vinny Junior, uh, Rodrigo, uh, uh, and others are, yeah, are yeah. taking the helm and, and putting putting the team forward. There is. Yeah, so I think uh, I would say probably between these three teams, Argentina, Colombia, and, and Brazil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, but we never know in football. And there was just one thing uh, on card that we we didn't talk. That I think it's important to mention. We talk a lot about Argentina and, and Brazil, a bit of Uruguay as well. But in the book, there is there is at least two or three chapters about about Colombia. I'm really and, interested, sir. It's just that yeah. a lot of the time media always focuses on the other. But no, no. Other, you know, yeah, yeah, is but, an interesting country. Yeah, but I I would say that one one of the chapter is about Igita, the goalkeeper. Yeah. And Rene Igita, I, right? Yeah, Rene Igita. I would invite you and, of course, your viewers to, to read that particular chapter because Igita's history, it's really interesting. And I don't know if you know that, but Igita, Igita has conquered something that nobody else, nor Pelé, nor Maradona, no Messi or Ronaldo did. Igita has changed the game's rules. Mm. Yeah, because of him, yeah, and I mean he his way of playing outside the box as a goalkeeper when nobody did, 
that they changed the rules because beforehand in the 90s and before this, the defenders could just pass back to the goalkeeper. The yeah, goalkeeper could catch the balls. Mm -hmm. And after what uh, Igita has shown in the 1990, 1990 sorry, uh, World Cup in Italy, yeah, playing as if he was a, 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 a midfielder with his feet outside the box, they changed this rule. Mm -hmm. And because of this rule that today we have another player, today we have all these goalkeepers who play all this pressure system that the, the best the best coaches they put together, it's because of Igita. So Igita changed not only the, the rules of the game, but the way we play nowadays the game. So I think it's, a, it's, it's important also to highlight him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Rene Higida, we, at least I grew up watching the highlights of football and Rene Higida was always a part of those. You know, with his scorpion kick saves and then him playing yeah. as a, almost a different... He is. There, there is a draw of him in, in the in my book's cover, if you if you oh. look at this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. is in, in, in my book's cover. Yeah, he's a fantastic, a fantastic uh, character. So thank you. Thank you very much, Onkar. Yeah, thank you, sir. Anything else you'd like to say about your book and uh, anything else you'd like to share, finally? No, yeah, I think, yeah, I think that's it. Well, there is, there are, as I said, there are stories about, for example, there is one chapter that shows how nowadays the enchadas, yeah, the, uh, the active supporters in Argentina, in Uruguay, in Chile, uh, they are still fighting the, the dictatorship that that endured from the 70s and the 80s and killed so many people. They say they will never forget mm. and, and they will never uh, they, they want still to prosecute the, the people who were responsible for so many killings and, and disappearings and who are still connected with, with football. So football there has also been a place for people to heal and to to look for the truth, so which is which is an important uh, political and social role of football in South America. Yeah, I mean in South America, football is connected to everything, as you've shown us. To summarize, yeah. sir, really thank you for joining our podcast. It was really great talking to you about South American football. You piqued a great amount of interest in me at least for South American football and what goes on behind the scenes of South American football. I'll be sure to read your book and know about Colombia, Argentina, Chile, Peru, Brazil, Uruguay, so many teams. So, sir, again, I'd like to thank you for coming. Had a lot of fun learning many things from you. Shalom. Thank Bye. you.